Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, their day today. Welcome to our closing plenary, Technology and Latino Wealth. My name is Uriel Lopez, and I am the CHCI Child Welfare Graduate Fellow. The topic of this session is of personal interest to me because as our society and economy become more reliant on technology, there are communities disproportionately excluded from economic opportunities in an increasingly digital economy. This tech summit is the beginning of an ongoing conversation on how we can stay engaged and intervene in the racial wealth gap so that our communities can move forward. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Google, Airbnb, and MasterCard for their generous support of this session. Even with inclusive financial technologies, alternative pathways to success found exclusively in digital spaces and investments in Latino innovators and STEM workers, white families still have an average five times more wealth than Latino families. We will hear from technology leaders on how they plan to address racial, generational, and gender wealth gaps in America, and how the sector can ensure the tools they create are designed to ensure Latino inclusion and equity. To kick off our session, it is my honor to introduce the session chair, Congresswoman Sylvia R. Garcia, who represents Texas 29th Congressional District. Congresswoman Garcia became the first Hispanic member of the Houston Congressional Delegation and one of the first two Latinas to represent the state of Texas in the US Congress. Representative Garcia is a native of Palito Blanco, a South Texas farming community. Congresswoman Garcia's parents taught her that with hard work and a good education, she could accomplish anything. Representative Garcia serves on the House Judiciary and House Financial Services Committee. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia. Thank you and good afternoon. Well, let me, um, Usually I don't comment on an introduction other to say that it was a great introduction. Uh, but since um, about probably September, I also serve on the House Armed Services Committee. So I serve on three committees and um, it does in fact keep, keep me very busy. Uh, but not too busy to come say hello and, and visit with you all for just a few minutes to introduce this panel. Uh, I think the, the uh, committee that I serve on that's probably more relevant uh, to you all's discussions today is Financial Services Committee. Um, I think it's important that when we look at technology, that we look at, it, look at it as an opportunity for Latinos to build our wealth. Uh, you know, for us to ever really make a landmark, to, for us to really make a footprint on our communities, we've got to do more in building our wealth within our own community. And no one's going to do it for us. We're gonna to have to seize on the opportunities that are there. So as a Congresswoman, I know that, that when I look at things, I always first look at my own district, which is 77% Latino. It's in the heart of Houston's Hispanic community. And everything I do uh, is always underscored by a foundation of, of making sure that I fight for equity, that I fight for inclusion, and that I fight for diversity. It's no longer good enough to say, yes, we are diverse. It's just not enough. You have to be inclusive. You have to be able to make sure that the people at the table feel included so that they can say what's on their minds and they can effectively communicate and contribute to any discussion. So anytime that you fight for the table, make sure that it comes with inclusion, not just the seat. So for me as a member of Congress in the financial services, I also serve as vice chair of the diversity and inclusion committee, subcommittee. So on that role, I work together with our chairwoman, uh, Joyce Beatty, on making sure that as we look at the whole financial sector, uh, that we look and make sure that we don't repeat what I call the mistakes of the past. That as we move forward, 
uh, that, that all the financial services sector, we need to make sure that they are diverse and inclusive. So through my community project funding for my district, I have supported youth STEM initiatives to encourage a pipeline of diverse STEM workers. Through extensive work, including three bills, which I've introduced in Congress this year, I have fought especially for language inclusion. It's not just about race and sex and all the usual diversity list that you see. It's also about financial literacy, and it's also making sure that we get past the language barriers. So I have fought for language inclusion for limited English consumers in the financial sector. Everything from a uh, bill to make sure that every, every all of the mortgage financing follow-up that's done after someone buys a home or to buy a home, that it also be made, the documents, the loan applications, everything in the language of their own that they can better understand. Because I have personally seen, back in the days when I was a legal aid lawyer, where people simply could not read that their payment was due, that in fact it caused them to end up being delinquent and being foreclosed on. That's got to stop. So financial inclusion is a very big priority for me. So I have no doubt that this undertaking can be better assisted by te technological innovation and more Latino inclusion in the entire financial technology workforce. Again, we are finding, and we found through some hearings that we had, that part of the reason that some of these things aren't being done because the people that are behind the computer, the programmers, the people working the computers are not inclusive. They're predominantly white male. So who's going to think about these things but us? Because we, present, we represent us. So through meetings with top officials at digital asset firms have made it clear that the crypto space must also be regulated and be inclusive, especially with some of the news we heard this last week. Regulation is needed now more than ever. In doing so, we must develop an inclusive, accessible financial innovation. We cannot let any the space of cryptocurrency or anything in the crypto space repeat the same mistakes that the banking and traditional financial institutions have made. And I've made that clear uh, to some of the crypto officials that I have spoken to. And the Financial Services Committee under Sherwoman Waters' leadership has highlighted the need to address artificial intelligence and machine learning bias to ensure that these new technologies do not worsen the racial wealth gap. Again, as we look at, at the challenges of AI, we need to make sure that that does not repeat the mistakes of the past. So all these efforts which I've been proud to work on are the beginning of a long road to equitable financial health for the Latino community. And again, as we innovate, we must make sure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. So that's why events like this are so important to bring you all together to discuss these topics, to share and to learn and to create and to start thinking about what we must do as ourselves, our own community, to help reduce the racial wealth gap because it exists not only for Latinos, it exists for African-Americans. And as we found in one of our hearings, it exists for the LGBTQ community. So we must move forward to make sure that as we innovate and lean on technology, that we make it as inclusive and as fair and equitable to everyone. So that's the challenge. I'm glad you're here discussing it, and you all have a great event. Thank, Thank you all very much. Thank you, Congresswoman Garcia. Now it is my pleasure to introduce welcoming remarks from Susanna Coley Jacobson, Marketing Manager at Google for Startups. Please welcome Susanna Jacobson. Thank you again, Representative Garcia. I always love meeting another blonde Latina. <laughs> 
Good afternoon. I want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute today for inviting me to join you. I'm excited to kick off the final session of the day, and I appreciate your time and attention here. My name is Susanna Coley Jacobson, and I'm with the Google for Startups team, and I'm honored to be with you. I'm here representing thousands of Googlers, including Latino Googlers, who are all working hard every day to help level the playing field for underrepresented communities inside and outside of Google. In just a few minutes, we'll hear from an incredible group of panelists who will discuss how tech can be used to address racial, generational, and gender wealth gaps in America. A little bit about myself. I'm the daughter of Cuban immigrants who came to this country leaving behind everything they had. And as a Latina, I've seen firsthand how access to opportunity can echo through to the next generation. My father reminded me of this consistently growing up, but it wasn't until I got older that I appreciated the sacrifice loss that my parents and grandparents went through. That's why I've dedicated my time at Google to do the same for Latino communities and more specifically Latino led startups that are on the same journey. In my role at Google for startups, I'm proud to work with some of the most talented founders across the country. They're working on addressing important challenges in our community like reimagining re speech recognition, improvements in fintech, and improving how the legal system is navigated by individuals from diverse backgrounds. It's through our partnerships at Google for Startups that we work to elevate these leaders who are breaking barriers within their, their respective industries so that we all may grasp opportunities more equally and equitably. As far as Latino-led startups are concerned, we know that they only receive 2% of venture capital, despite making up 20% of the population. That's why Google recently made a new $7 million commitment to advance economic equity in the Latino startup ecosystem. Earlier this year, we launched the Google for Startups Latino Founders Fund. We identified 50 of the most talented Latino-led startups from across the US and awarded them with non-dilutive cash award of $100,000. In addition to the cash, founders have access to wraparound services, including Google-led training and workshops, $100,000 in cloud credits, and mental health resources, which we've learned through our work can be transformational. In addition to the work led by Google for Startups, our Grow with Google team partners with Latino-serving organizations to invest in expanding Latinx representation in the tech industry. These partnerships invest in skills and talent of Latinos both entering the workforce and those looking to change careers. Thanks to Grow with Google's partnership with the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, thousands of Latino small business owners have completed trainings on how to adapt and grow their businesses in the digital economy. And we're expanding the Grow with Google Career Readiness Program in partnership with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities to train more students at Hispanic serving institutions in digital skills and career development. Before we kick off our session though, I do wanna thank again CHCI for their leadership in advancing issues that impact our community and for welcoming us to participate and learn from the many leaders here. On behalf of Google, thank you. Thank you all for your commitment to drive economic opportunity for Latinos. With that, I'll pass it back to Uriel. Thank you, Susanna, for your engaging remarks. Now let's begin our conversation. To facilitate this panel, we are delighted to have Lily Gangas as our moderator for this session. Lily is a Chief Technology Community Officer at the Caper Center, working to create new and more inclusive tech innovation ecosystems regionally and nationally. Her work is centered at the intersection of technology, economic justice, and action-driven partnerships to tackle pressing social and economic inequities of underrepresented communities head-on. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Lily Gunn. We'll do the tech check, there we go. All right, because I, I tend to talk a little loud, so let's just all get ready. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uriel, Susana, the entire CHCI team for inviting me uh, to specifically moderate this topic that is so close to my heart, technology and wealth building. Why? Because like many of you, I saw the power that technology can have to change my life, but also change my family's life. I was able to pursue uh, electrical engineering, software engineering. So the STEM worker, the STEM students that they were talking about, I'm one of those. I'm the product of what technology as a career can bring, the economic opportunity where I was able to, with my first job, with no experience, be able to make two, three times what my mom was earning. But let that sink in of the power of how much wealth is being generated. 
When I was in college, I actually had my roommate. She was a CHCI uh, uh, intern at that time. And all I wanted to do was be her. <laughs> uh, she got to work on, like, real issues that matter. I'm like, she gets to talk to people. I'm in the lab working on things. Just didn't make sense how all these parts would connect until now. And so I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thank you all for this is the closing out. And it's actually, I think, one of the most important conversations because we want to address the challenges, but we also want to address the innovations and together look at what is possible. And if we're also just reflecting on what's been the last week, how many of you all are just like coming back to life after seeing what happened on Election Day and waiting to see the results, right? But I think what's astounding is really the power of the Latinx community, not just in numbers, but in action. And also, how do we also create that inclusive environment that is needed? And with that said, um, at the Caper Center, for the folks who may not know what that is, you heard my bio, you're like, I don't get it. I'll tell you what we do. <laughs> We're a private foundation that uh, provides research, provides grants, provides partnership, all really looking at possible ways and solutions to address the racial disparities in the tech sector, everything from who has access to computer science by zip codes, all the way to the different types of uh, pathways into technology, addressing the algorithmic harms that some of the technologies we're using has, but also the lack of not only the, the entrepreneurs, but the investors who are investing in these new technologies. And I'm super excited to say that just this past year, we've been able to provide over $7 million to organizations at that intersection and another $2 million to civic engagement organizations because all of these areas go hand in hand. Um, and you can learn more about that at the Caper Center uh, tech policy that we just released. But all that to say that I want to make sure that we also address, as, as I mentioned, with this amazing steam panel that's here that have been so patiently waiting for, for all of us to get started. Before we jump in, if you hear gems that you really want to share with your friends, use the hashtag CHCI Summit. You got it? You're going to use technology for good, right? I'm looking at everyone from one side to the other. Great. So now we're going to get ready to get into the meat of the conversation. And be, to be able to do that, we're going to please give a warm welcome to our amazing three panelists. They're going to introduce themselves, but we'll start with Gonzalo, Viviana, and then Kendra. So we're all ready, right? It's been a long day. Let's go. Well, Lily, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Gonzalo Palacio. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Opportune. I'll start by saying that I benefited uh, as an immigrant from a scholarship to study engineering in the United States and leaving and joining a bank. Uh, one of my first things was even though I worked at a bank, I was not able to get a credit card. Uh, after a year or so, I got a credit card with a $300 line. And only three years later, I was able to get a credit card with a $1,000 line. And there were a lot of close calls along the way. Um, getting to know the my back, through my background and getting to the Latino community, really working on a mission-based approach and providing access to financial service, services has been the light for my professional career. And uh, the company I work for now, Opportune, um, is really uh, the place that's allowed to really expand that. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Opportune. Opportune is a mission-based financial uh, technology company that provides uh, financial services access to traditionally underserved uh, communities. The origin story of the company was providing uh, access to loans to initially to Spanish-speaking immigrants. And from there, we've been able to expand and provide a broader set uh, uh, of services, both to immigrants, uh, Latinos, and just a broader set of hardworking Americans. Um, in doing so, we've been able to, uh, over the last 16 years, over $14 billion uh, in affordable and inclusive loans. Uh, we've been able to provide and create uh, credit histories for a million customers. Um, as well, during that time, we've uh, also acquired uh, the Digit app, which is a service that allows our members to save uh, effortlessly. And through the app, uh, we've managed to help them save over $8 billion uh, along the way. We do this uh, by scoring every single applicant. And even though an applicant doesn't have a credit score or may not have even an SSN, we're able to underwrite them and offer them a loan or a credit card, which is particularly unique. Um, in that case, one of the most recent products we launched is a credit card that even for someone who has no credit score, uh, we're able to offer a credit line up to $1,000, which is a really unique um, value proposition. Um, thank you very much, to CHCI, for the invitation. and really looking forward to a really good discussion today. Really? I like to hear the $14 billion. I like the billion dollar sound yes. since we're in this session. <laughs> Viviana, please introduce yourself and share a little bit more about your work. 
Yes, thank you, Italy. Uh, my name is Viviana Jordan. I am a regional policy lead on the North America public policy team for Airbnb. My um, sort of journey uh, started in, in education. Originally, I graduated from Florida International University in Miami, which is the number one university in the U.S. for granting um, Hispanic students uh, bachelor's and master's degrees. So that was a really important place for me to start um, my higher ed journey and really get an understanding and, and build around a community that was so focused on Latino issues and where so many students were first generation students and really um, sort of forging their own path. And from there, I went on to work for almost a decade um, at one of the top three largest um, school districts in the country, Miami-Dade County Public Schools, which has uh, the really high number of students of Hispanic background origin. And so that was another opportunity through my time working there to really see the challenges, um, but the, also the opportunities and the bright spots and the progress uh, that can be made when we really um, drive toward inclusivity and when we do it intentionally. And so that's sort of my background, my perspective, uh, where I come to, um, to issues around the, the Hispanic community. And um, then my journey brought me to Airbnb. So this is where I am now. And I'm really excited to share uh, with this group through the conversation how um, my work and, and, and my background really in, helps inform uh, the, the decisions and, and the, the guidance that we provide to uh, public officials, uh, state and local public officials throughout the country as it relates to entrepreneurship, to home ownership um, and economic empowerment opportunities for all communities. Looking forward to that segment. And Kendra, please introduce yourself as well. Sure, so it's um, truly delightful to be a part of the panel today. I'm Kendra Brown, Vice President of Public Policy at MasterCard. Thank you to CHCI for hosting us and for in inviting us. Um, I have been at MasterCard for almost three years in uh, March. Uh, I came to MasterCard from um, serving as Chief of Staff to Congressman G.K. Butterfield, um, and I think the timing, I had no idea that what would happen in the world uh, would impact all of us. So I started at MasterCard on March the 3rd of 2020, so just let that sink in, wow. right? So uh, everything changed uh, for each and every one of us, right? Um, and so I uh, am passionate about the work that I do at MasterCard. I connect with uh, third-party advocacy groups, um, many who do work in social justice. I work with the administration. I work with members of Congress in moving forward um, policies and efforts to ensure that we are um, bringing as many individuals as possible into uh, the financial network in the digital economy as possible. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, serving on Capitol Hill for as long as I did, um, did uh, a significant amount of work in the area of um, computer science for all moving forward uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus, CBC Tech 2020, you know, work where we're looking at and have always looked at how we ensure that we have a pipeline into tech uh, that is diverse and reflective of our communities and our nation. Um, I also uh, had the privilege of serving in a volunteer capacity as the Maryland State Advisory Committee Chair for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And so I bring the, the lens of equity to every role that I am in and every space that I am in. I uh, went to law school up in Vermont in the Green Mountain State uh, and graduated from Hampton University down in the Tidewater area, which is one of our HBCUs. So I'm very passionate about ensuring that we are doing all that we can to bring individuals into uh, roles in tech to see how tech can continue to um, bring equity to all that we do in financial systems. So it's a true delight to be a part today. I told you this is an amazing set of speakers, experts, community leaders, right? So let's give them a little bit of warm up. Come on. So let is here. So what's, what's going to happen, I'm going to start first with acknowledging how technology itself hasn't been inclusive to just make sure we all are, uh, have a foundational understanding of the gaps, but also we'll move into the opportunities. So I'm going to share some stats, so, so bear with me as I, as I read them, but I think it's really important that we have a common understanding, especially when we see how much wealth has been created in technology. 
But yeah, the racial wealth disparities that we, that we are experiencing, maybe we each have experienced in our own families, are also uh, wealth gaps of generations, right, that have ranged from exclusion and education, who got to go to school, who didn't, who got to get uh, the types of jobs, who had affordable rates for loans, right, if you're buying your first home. Um, being able to also, there was understanding that there was intentional destruction in some of the communities, specifically black, Latinx communities historically, that we have to address. And yet these disparities are not just data points because they've actually have had con- consequences that we're still living right now. So over the last 30 years, which is the 1990s, some of you may not have been born, but that's okay. I'm not going to disclose mine. But to the 2020s, and I'll give you a hint, the internet was born in 1983. We saw the median wealth assets of white families be more than 41 times of that of a black family. We saw it also be 22 times more than the median wealth of the Latinx family. And this continues to, continuously continues to impact, again, our, who has access to equitable education, health, as we saw during the pandemic, but also the different types of employment opportunities and how to get those jobs, right? As we're starting to see more movement towards non-degree type of employments, we're looking at alternative pathways. And yet, I think one of the parts that is interesting is that there is just huge amounts of wealth over the same time that has been built by the tech workers, by the executive, and the investors themselves, especially during the time of the pandemic, where we saw tech contributing to $1.8 trillion in the economy, 9 million jobs that were paying over 125% above the median wage gap, right? We also saw in $330 billion in one year in venture capital go to 12,000 companies. Yet, 1% of those went to black founders, 2% of that went to Latinx founders. Unless if you're, and if you're also Latina, or a black woman, we saw 0.45% of all those billions of dollars go to your company. And when we think about where is all the wealth being created, who is building it, we're still at the disparity that we have 9% of the the tech workforce is black, 7% is Latinx. And as we're seeing the current layoffs in technology, we're regressing. And so I'm here to really turn on the fire for us to address the moment that we're in, because we're going to have to go in real in deep and significantly, given the wealth that is being created, but also the wealth that is being left out. Especially when you think about in 2040, when you all are probably building your families, the majority of the population is going to be Black and Latinx. And if we're missing this wave now continuously, even after we came out of the pandemic, we're really here to we need something totally different. And so I'm really, uh, we'll get started in getting down into the questions, but I wanted to just make sure that we had this context of understanding because as you think about the wealth creation and wealth building, five of the largest billionaires that made their money through these tech companies doubled their wealth in the last year in the, lar- the hardest time of our communities. And yet the corporate rate of, on, t- on these companies have been the lowest they've been in 40 years. So if there's opportunities for policy changes and new ways to look at this and new ways to really address some of the, the, the funding that's needed in our systems, our education systems, our employment systems, the time is now. So with that said, I, I know I said a lot, but I wanted to get all your perspectives, especially of like, why is this significant? And what, how do we address it and what's at stake? So why don't we start with you first? Yeah, absolutely. A lot to cover there. And there's a history of structural problems and and issues that sort of um, have created that situation. But specific to uh, Opportuna, I think that there's two areas that that from inception we've been focusing on. One is addressing the um, variable cash flow uh, for our members and also being able to build a safety net uh, along the way. So from a variable cash flow perspective, uh, many of our of our members don't have a credit score to begin with, and don't have they're effectively invisible to mainstream uh, banks. So if something comes up where they have an emergency, where it's to fix a car, a uh, medical emergency, or even to send money to relatives back in Guatemala or in Mexico, they don't have the means to do that other than going to a payday lender or a title loan that may actually create an even worse issue for them. So our loans are structured uh, and designed to be able to underwrite members who don't have that kind of traditional mainstream background. And in doing so, they actually create a credit score 
that then puts them on the radar to, to get offers for traditional credit cards and so forth. And that's something that we see around 20% of the members who uh, came to us without a credit score uh, a year later have opened a credit card. And among those who come and take a second loan with us, almost 50% have had access to a credit card. And now we offer our own credit card. But what happens with a credit card, um, again, this is a responsible and, and, and sort of structured so they're able to, to pay us back. And we only win if they're able to pay us back, is that they now have on-demand funds if something comes up, and that actually pro- sort of protects them in the event that things happen. Many of our members have one or two jobs. Sometimes they, they need that extra income, and there's variability in that. So the access to funds there helps a lot. And then the second one, again, with the Digit app, is being able to build that safety net and set targets that they can uh, almost effortlessly achieve the down payment for a new rental or even for a deposit on a new home. By creating that safety net, and on average, uh, at the median uh, digit app member um, saves around two thousand dollars. So it gives you an idea of the scope, and and it's it's it has to do a lot with the, how it works in the background to to build that. So between those two things, there's a starting foundation, I think, for the development of wealth. And and then from our perspective, uh, we offer omnichannel experience both with physical stores, through the phone, or through the app and online, and a fully bilingual experience on the lending side. On the Digit app, uh, we, which we acquire re- currently is in English, but we're, we'll have a release in Spanish coming up soon. So I think those, those are the kind of top areas. It would have been so helpful for my mom when we first immigrated because she was, we were always like $200 short of making rent. And if she would have had something like that, maybe it would have made a bigger difference in our own wealth building. Talking about wealth building and housing and home, Viviana. I mean, Airbnb has been a home for sometimes for all, maybe, I don't know how many of you, especially here, um, thinking about it as a way to rethink housing, right? So we'd love to hear more about just all those stats that I shared, right? As there are systemic issues, but especially in your role and in, in what you're working um, at Airbnb and working at the public sector as well. We'd love to hear your, your Yeah, reflection. absolutely. I think I definitely want to touch on from the employee perspective, right, in terms of what are we doing to diversify our own, um, our own teams internally. And so that's certainly top of mind to leadership. As a matter of fact, we made a public commitment a number of years ago that our goal by the year 2025 is to have 20% of our workforce in the U.S. be underrepresented minorities. So that is sort of a very specific goal that that we're tracking towards. We're also very proud of the fact that we are above industry average in terms of that percentage you reference around 7% for the Hispanic community. Um, Our numbers are higher than that. And that, I think, shows our intentional um, approach to um, lessening um, the or reducing the gap on that front. But there's also incredible opportunity when it comes to our host community. And our host community are everyday people. They are everyday people across communities in this country and around the world. And so just to sort of give a very concrete example of the type of conversations we have with lawmakers is as you think of a city, right? A city is trying to pass an ordinance on short-term rentals, how to regulate them. Um, Oftentimes, and I don't think this is intentional, but I I like to say that if you don't intentionally include, you're unintentionally excluding. And so they will draft these ordinances and it'll say, the owner must provide, the owner must provide, the owner must do this, the owner must renew. And when we look at it with a lens for diversity and equity and inclusion, What comes to mind to us is this city is limiting the opportunity of hosting, um, of earning that supplemental income. It is limiting it to property owners only. And in a lot of communities, there have been groups that have been historically marginalized in the housing space. And so they may not own property. They may be renting with the goal of saving up money and then purchasing that home. Right. But if a local government is saying, no, you don't get even if your landlord is okay with you renting your long term tenant and the landlord is okay with you renting a room or renting that access, that ADU um, accessory dwelling unit that you have, you're not going to be able to do it. And you're not going to be able to generate that extra income that's probably going to get you over that, get those two hundred dollars a month that you need. Right. To add to your savings. And so we come in and we'll say. We don't think this was intentional, but we would just like to point out that based on the drafting of this ordinance, you are excluding a community of renters that are also constituents, that are also voters, that also deserve an opportunity to benefit from the sharing economy. And 
usually we get a really good reception to that, right? And because, again, I don't think it's intentional, but I think it takes going above and beyond, right? It takes really critically looking at policies that, you know, sometimes people are just like, yeah, this is fine. Let's move on. It looks okay. But um, there always needs to be an eye for, for diversity and inclusion. And that's one way in which we um, endeavor to expand access to home sharing, um, among a number of other ways, uh, which we can get into throughout this conversation, um, because we are laser focused on increasing the diversity of our community. If we are expecting to welcome diverse guests, we need to have a diverse hosting community, and we critically understand that. Definitely, and I love the approach of the intentional design across the workforce, who you're creating the services for, how you attract them. And then on that note, I know, um, Kendra, as you shared the, the, what MasterCard is doing in itself and some of the products in your own background, we'd love to just get a reflection of um, what can we do to address some of those stats, right, that I shared. And granted, there's stats in the past because we can change the future, but we want to make sure that we're also understanding the disparities and how huge they are. So we'd love to get your perspective on that as well. Sure, and I want to piggyback on what you were saying. It really does require intentionality. Um, across the board. <clears throat> I think that some of the things that we're doing at MasterCard, um, I know you've seen the, um, the announcement that we have on the um, boards here relative to our Master Your Card program. So Master Your Card is um, our initiative and program that we've had for many, many years where we um, teach financial literacy in schools and in communities. Um, and I no, just um, over the past two years, we've been in over 300 schools. We've educated more than 21,000 students. And so we continue our Master Year Card efforts to really ensure that there is knowledge and education on how to manage, you know, your money and how to do that well and how to maximize your money and actually make it work for you, too. Um, there are so many um, ways that companies and entities can really ensure that their products and services are meeting the needs of the communities. Uh, we have at MasterCard our Digital Doors, a program which is for small businesses. And so we uh, help small businesses have wraparound services, particularly in communities of color, uh, to ensure that one, they are digitized. Because what we have learned, even in having one-on-one -on -one conversations with entrepreneurs and those who are small business owners is that the lack of digitization leaves so much money on the table, right? Um, and so we are helping to ensure that small business owners and entrepreneurs have the tools that they need. We've also made a commitment. We have brought over 500 million entities into the digital economy. We have a pledge of uh, bringing 500 million more right into the digital economy. Um, those are some of the things that that we are doing. We also have our Start Path um, initiative where we are assisting venture capital uh, uh, founders. So uh, we are uh, providing funding for founders, right, and for founders of color. And so uh, we are glad to be at the table and to really have inclusive product design at the core of what we um, do. And so those are some of the ways. Um, access is imperative, and we want to ensure that we're doing our part to um, have equity in access and financial products and services. I love that, that perspective of having an ecosystem lens on all of this, right? From the education to the access to investing in the people who are hopefully also investing in their own communities through entrepreneurship. So I think that that's really important. So I'm going to do one more question on like the what, the what now, and then we're going to move into the solutions. Um, and part of that is this, this, right, coming out of the pandemic is the learnings, right? My concern is that I don't think we should be doing business as usual, right? This is the time to change the business models, to change the approach. And in fact, we all had to adopt, right? How many of you here had to help your mom, your tias, grandmas? Like overnight, we're all tech, right? We also had the pain also in who had access as, as students, who had access to jobs from work from home. So knowing all that stuff of what we just went through, and especially the economic downturns, right, that we experienced and where we're starting to feel now, wondering what are some of those key learnings that you saw, especially around wealth building, that you want folks here um, as they advocate for their own communities, for themselves, to really take with them forward, especially as we navigate some of these next next few months that are feel a little challenging, maybe a few years. Feel free to jump in as a popcorn way over here. Well, I, I can, I can go, go next on that one. So we, we just do a few observations of what we saw. We pre-pandemic, we're getting around 4 million 
visitors a year into our website. We moved to 10 million uh, visitors. Uh, this, this, this full shift on scope of those who are going to stores or calling actually started doing it directly uh, into our website. Um, around 90% of our, of, our, of our users are um, coming in through, through mobile or visiting through mobile, though they still visit the stores. A lot of the applications just shift to mobile uh, overall. And I think it, there, there was a learning curve um, that we continue to add support through the call center. And e- even though, and I think to, to what the representative mentioned, there is that interest in understanding the disclosures or payments in Spanish. And so we still uh, offer that uh, through a call center f- uh, fully staffed in Spanish. Um, and then the, the last piece that I think was, was, uh, was helpful in, in, in that journey is... Um, you know, the, the, the elements of going from um, kind of paper verification mm-hmm. in stores to uh, providing solutions where you can validate, uh, for example, your income either through Plaid by creating a connection to your banking account that seamlessly lets us allow, kind of check uh, your cash flow if necessary uh, versus having to like upload uh, documents uh, through that. So we basically uh, took a big step forward in the adoption of digital. And along the way, we provided additional elements of assistance. So we, uh, through a partnership with Unidos uh, uh, US, we, uh, for those who ask, we'll give um, one-on-one uh, like personal um, banking uh, or, or you know, wealth building or payment uh, lessons on financial education. Um, and then for those who needed a deferral, uh, we gave an option of like one-click deferral through text message. And so the... I think the big takeaway was there was a fast adoption of mobile and then providing the uh, right support cushion where it was in the, in the Spanish or language of choice, uh, support uh, one-on-one direct support through you know, those, uh, U.S., and then the ability to just use text messages to uh, defer your payments and maybe get back uh, on time when you're kind of gone through a difficult situation. I love that. That's such a great example of just, that's a real great case study of how you actually help not only build inclusive products, but also launch them and continuously make sure that there's a trustworthy person, right? And that could be your Unidos in that case who was helping as digital navigators. And those are also jobs that are being created. So I love the wealth on building on wealth on building. Hashtag that. <laughs> uh, for you, Viviana and Kendra, feel free to jump in as well of what, what are some of the things that, that we learned, that we jumped right in, that we don't want to leave behind, but could actually help us move forward and innovate and hopefully be able to close more of these wealth gaps? Yeah, I think one of the things um, that I found most interesting through the pandemic is obviously at, at our business, at the core of travel, we definitely um, felt, um, felt the impact financially, but also we started to see trends that became really interesting, which was, yes, people all of a sudden can't get on a plane and, you know, they're not traveling um, far and wide. But what we started to see was after a couple of months, there was an uptick in the business again. We were like, wait a second, where are people going? How are, what are they doing? And what we found is that people were going places that were a tank of gas away. So they were traveling by car because that was safer. And so we're like, okay, people want to get out of their homes. So this is a positive trend, (laughs) but they are not going to Paris. They are not going to New York City. They're not going to big cities. They're looking for their options. And so as we followed that trend and we saw that people were also staying longer whenever they did travel because remote work opportunities, et cetera, um, we learned that we had a really unique opportunity to help disperse or distribute the benefits of um, tourism to communities that are not Paris, New York City, LA. Um, And so we actually worked on our product and we said, let's ask ourselves a question of why when you go to Airbnb.com or to most other platforms, you have to list where you're going in order to see available lodging. Why not just ask questions like, how long do you intend to travel for? Or what month? Or what week? And then we will, as a platform, show you, we will point you to where we have supply and really unique types of supply. And so we developed categories and we understood that everybody is not looking for a condo in the middle of a city center in a downtown area. There's people looking, especially in the pandemic, 
for farms and for cabins and just for unique accommodations that are in places that usually don't see a lot of tourism. And so one development of categories, but two, really pointing demand to where we had supply. And so what that resulted in was people who had homes, rooms, ADUs, you know, et cetera, that maybe were, had moved in, right? A lot of people, especially um, uh, folks who lost their jobs, were in a situation where maybe they didn't want to sell their home and lose their home, but they moved in with a family member. So now they can list their entire home to save it. And that's what's going to allow them to keep their home down the line. And But it may not be in a top city that people would look to, you know, type in and go to, or that's too far away or that you need to get to by plane. And so it was a really unique opportunity for a lot of small places in between the big cities to see the benefits of tourism and to be able to welcome visitors and for visitors too to discover places that they would have never even been able to find on a map. And so that's one of, um, that's one of the things that I think that came out of the pandemic, but that now we've gotten just really positive response from that people are like, this is great. I can key in farms and not key in any city or state. And all of a sudden, you know, you just show me where these places are. And a lot of times, again, it's benefiting not just the hosts in those communities, our rural host earnings went through the roof. We had so, we were seeing so much wealth being generated in these rural areas because of that, because we were intentionally saying, go outside of the city centers, look what is beyond the cities. Um, And we've started to see people come back to cities, but now they know that there's a world outside of it. Um, And not only the host of benefit, but also the small businesses in those areas as well. I love that because that's an example of algorithms gone right. For good. (laughs) Bringing joy and learning and being to actually help us (laughs) discover new things. And now it's actually being very profitable because it's bringing you all the, their growth in a challenging time. I love that. Um, Kendra, sure. please. Sure. So just a few things that I would um, share. Um, during the pandemic, um, one of the tools that was set forth by MasterCard's Center for Inclusive Growth is actually the Inclusive Growth Score. The Inclusive Growth Score um, is a tool that helps business owners, entrepreneurs, and regulators, too, all uh, know what is in the community, like what types of spending, um, you know, communities have. Um, And so it's a way to look at um, what is happening in a certain place um, to figure out what um, is best for your business, what tools you can offer. Uh, We we also offered um, cyber security for small businesses, and we still have that as an offering for small business owners and entrepreneurs, and many have utilized that. And that's a free monitoring that we provide for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, We have also launched our Data for Equity um, initiative where we're partnering with cities um, to uh, give them tools also to ensure that they are making the best decisions on behalf of their constituents and their um, citizens um, and those who live in their cities and in their communities. Um, And last but not least, we um, made in the midst of COVID, in the midst of 2020, and it continues now, right, a $500, $500 million commitment to closing the racial equity um, and uh, economic opportunity gap. And we have done that in partnership with entities across the nation, in partnership with organizations um, such as CHCI and LULAC, uh, right, and just many um, um, organizations to advocate for policies that impact communities in a positive way, um, but also we work internally, of course, to ensure that we have tailored products that really meet the need and serve the needs of communities. So those are some of the things that we have done in the midst of what we have seen as a result of the pandemic. And last but not least, we have something called our Spending Pulse. And the MasterCard Spending Pulse um, is a tool that um, shows, of course, all the data and all the trends, uh, which I'm sure that uh, <laughs> data like that is extremely helpful for Airbnb, right, to really look to, to see, um, you know, where people can go, uh, which I think that um, helps to really inform uh, the intentionality that we're having in expanding our perspectives, right, and seeing other things and uh, seeing new places. And so it, it is all all linked. And so those are some of the things that we have done. So you probably have a pulse on all my spending. As we're talking about <laughs> wealth building, it could be doing a little saving. 
Uh, on that <laughs> note, I think, um, actually with Kendra, it'll be great as to follow up on that part of like, we're, we're here with folks who are, you know, starting their careers, mid-careers, but also senior levels of helping drive policy change, right? And so curious to see where you're seeing um, opportunities, maybe the challenges, barriers, but maybe looking at some of the opportunities, whether it's at the federal, maybe a specific state level, mm-hmm. or even at the local level, as, as you've been looking and assessing, right, as part of that $500 million, I'm mm-hmm. sure there was a lot of strategy behind an assessment. Absolutely. And um, I think there are opportunities at every level. Um, all, all politics are local, right? <laughs> or at least they start locally, right? Um, I would say that ensure that um, entities are connecting with mayors. So we work with lots of mayors across the country. We work with state officials also. Um, I am on the federal team, but I do also work with a lot of state officials and many, many mayors across the country, um, and then folks ac- around the globe too. Um, I would say to ensure that um, you are looking at policies that are going to impact small businesses. We know that small businesses and entrepreneurs are um, drivers of community development um, and community empowerment and wealth, right? Um, and so I would say that some of the opportunities are also um, on the federal side, looking at ways that you can, for instance, move forward on computer science for all, right? Um, uh, bills and legislation that um, give funding and grants, right, for um, certain types of programs um, that are meeting the needs of our educational system. Um, one example that I will share, we just, um, on October the 20th, um, launched a partnership um, with the Information Technology um, Industry Council, ITIC, uh, in partnership with Morehouse to launch a computer, uh, a computing center, right? And so that's just one example. It's Morehouse College in Atlanta. And so uh, there are lots of different ways that we all can uh, work with colleges and universities. And I heard someone else speak about, you know, working with um, HSIs and organizations. And so I think there are lots of different ways that um, progress can really be moved forward forward in policy, but also in working directly with communities by working with um, educational systems, right? Students, faculty, um, because that uh, really helps us all to go the distance in the degrees that are offered, the jobs, you know, that are able to be obtained. um, And then those that don't need a degree, because there are a lot of tech jobs and tech roles where a degree is not needed. So I think that we just have to really be open-minded and have a... um, approach that really widens the lens on what we're able to do. I love that the thought of widening the lens, right? And especially began in your in your career, you're doing policy. You're getting to do this at a tech company. So it goes to show that you don't have to be, you know, that software engineer. You could be the marketer, the comms. You could be a Viviana and helping far from and far. them letting me anywhere near tech, which is Look, fantastic. we're all tech by now because if you've used the filter, <laughs> you've been introduced to algorithms. So we're all we're all in the same field now. <laughs> but on that end, Viviana, we'd love to hear, you know, you're especially you're at the, at the cross section of both the local, the county, the state. We'd love to just hear some of the challenges, but also the opportunities, especially at this intersection of technology and policy. Yeah, um, look, lots of of opportunity, um, but almost equal, I would say almost equal amounts of challenges. I think it's a little less so now, but especially a couple of years ago, um, it's it really comes down to education. I can't tell you how many meetings right. we would have a couple of years ago of just lawmakers, no concept of what, like, I would literally grab my phone and I would be like, so an app, like, let me show you, like you can find, (laughs) right? Like, um, so those are a little daunting, right? But it just showed me, right, that it's not a no on the other side. It's just a, I don't really understand what it is that you are trying to get me to pass policy on. Um, Mm. And so, Understanding that, right? Like having that in the back of your mind um, and leading with education overview, just awareness of what it is that the product is, but then how does it materialize in your community? What actually happens in your community um, once it's 
off the actual phone. And what um, communities have come to understand is when they see our host, they realize they're real people. They're your constituents. You probably know some of them, right? So that's been incredibly helpful, getting our host community in front of lawmakers. They are our best ambassadors. They are the ones who can tell the story, right? And sometimes hosts will say, well, what should I say? And I'm like, you share your story. I literally have no better talking points for you than you share your story, whether that is that you're income that you're earning from Airbnb helps you pay your child to go to college or helps you, you know, pay that medical bill. That is what matters. That is what policymakers need to know because that puts it in perspective for them. And also the businesses. We're working right now on a project in Chicago where working with our host community, with the Restaurant Association of the State of Illinois, to showcase and highlight um, restaurants, small businesses in communities in underrepresented communities within the greater um, Chicago area. And so these are all the things that help us from a policy perspective, move the ball forward. I think it comes down, unfortunately, I think the onus is on us sometimes to um, really bring it into focus for lawmakers and for for regulators, uh, for them to understand that Yes, this is based on an app that may be based in Silicon Valley, but there are real material benefits to your community. And that looks like the host, who a lot of policymakers don't realize um, a host on Airbnb gets to keep 97% of what they charge. So if you're charging $100 for a room, you get to keep 97 of those dollars, that this is not even like a 50-50 split with Airbnb, right? So we're talking about real dollars, real income that people are making. Additionally, you have the benefit of the taxes. We've collected billions of dollars of tax all over the world on behalf of our host. And so those taxes go back into communities to help them to support their destination marketing organizations, um, promote tourism. In some places, it goes to housing affordability funds, uh, places like Nashville, right? So there is um, a number of ways. And then also the economic impact of local workers and, um, and small businesses. So Definitely. And I think being able to see that money being invested back into the community, that you're able to see it and invest in the local businesses, um, the community itself, right? as, we, as we opened up some of the, the, the levels of dollars that are being made in, in technology, that's a really great example of how to be conscious about it. Because we've seen some of the food apps percentages go up really high in the midst of the pandemic. And so that could also be seen predatory. And I'm getting the Q&A sign. So get ready for your questions. Almost there, but not yet, because I have one question, one last question for you, and then we'll open it up real fast. Um, just looking at the, especially just at the, at the fintech, right? We got some of the comments looking at the, the cryptocurrency, some of these changes. What, what's the opportunity and challenges that you're seeing in, from a fintech perspective? Um, so so I, I think to, to build on what was just shared, I, I think that there's a clear opportunity to make the, uh, in the industry the terms for loans and credit just to be a lot easier to understand and for for the applicants just to know exactly what is the true cost of the loan, uh, true cost of a credit card when they t- take all the interest and fees in. And so for, for context of that $14 billion that I mentioned that we've, that we've uh, extended in loans, the Financial Health Network uh, did a study uh, comparing our loans to, for example, payday, uh, payday loans or title loans and they calculated that we've saved our members around uh, $2 billion in fees and interest comparatively, right? And, and our, our goal is, from our perspective, if, you know, loans that are paid back, our members win and we win as well. But we also want the industry as a whole to have a very clear uh, kind of set of rules that explain what is the true cost of a loan so that, you know, they don't pay more for that. Yeah. The set of rules that are true cost, yes, for everyone in multiple languages. All right, I think I have a question for time for one q and That's that? It's really refreshing to see y'all up there uh, representing us in a good way. Um, Really moved by your story, Gonzalo. And so just thank you, all of you, for being on the panel. Uh, It's a long-winded question to to unpack it, but I'm the former dean of summer school at Harvard University. And one of the things that we didn't tell the public is that our summer school program was a cash cow. We also didn't say publicly, and most universities do this, that our master's programs are the cash cows and how we earn our money. I'm no longer at Harvard University. I run a program in Oakland, California. And so, Gonzalo, um, well, all of you, you talked about 
um, the equity efforts that you're a part of, right? And so I was just doing a little bit of research, right? And as I looked up Oportun, uh, I saw that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, did a, a civil investigation on your organization because during the pandemic, when Latinos were struggling the most, uh, your company sued over 5,000 Latinos uh, to get their money back uh, in really horrible ways. And then um, at Airbnb, they did a study from Purdue University where they found that who's benefiting the most from Airbnb is still white communities, um, not so much black and brown. And when you think about credit card data, debt in the Latino community, the more in debt that our community can be, the more money MasterCard makes. And so I just want to ask y'all, where does that sit with y'all, these investigations, this, this reporting, and the fact that all of your companies have cash cows because you're money-making institutions, but it doesn't always trickle down to the community. And so where does that sit with y'all? And then how do you navigate those challenges in your institutions? I, I, can, I can just give a, a context because I think one of, one of the challenges is that we're all complicit in capitalism. So let's keep it all real. We're all making money in certain ways, and I think it's important for also to address the consequences that we are doing in our business, in our business practices and how we can be more inclusive. So thank you, Cesar, for sharing that because I think those are the challenges that all these companies are facing as well as all the other tech companies, which is why CHCI is so important to be able to have these real conversations, think about the, the learnings, where is the disproportional impact and really addressing them very honestly and transparent as much as possible. And I think this is a world where policy can, can play an important role if we're definitely informed. So we'll love to just get your, your reactions, feedback, and, and thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, so Airbnb, as I mentioned, the breakdown between host and um, Airbnb's, um, I guess, commission, if you will, off of the, um, the transaction amount is 97 to 3. So then that is a constant and that doesn't change based on the community in which you are or the city or seasonality or anything like that. That is just standard. Um, so we would argue that the, the bulk of, of the revenue does sit with the host who is listing that room or that ADU, et cetera. In terms of increasing right, the diversity of our host community, as I mentioned earlier, critically important. One of the things that we're doing and that we started a couple of years ago abroad is this idea of an Airbnb Academy. And what that is, is the recognition, right, that as we've talked about and sort of a common theme, that the that difference between equity and equality, right? Like some communities just need some additional help, some additional fi financial or digital, right, like literacy in order to be able to benefit from the, some of these technologies. And so what that means in practical terms is that we partner through the academy. We find local partners in what would be considered underserved communities. So if we've been to places like LA and going to where there's a high Hispanic population or high numbers of, of black population, et cetera, same in Miami. We just had one last week in Miami. And what we do is we have our folks develop effectively a curriculum, right, for how to become a host 101. And we lean on those community partners to help us source who could be potential host on the platform. And we clarify, as I mentioned earlier, right, you don't have to be a property owner. If you're a property owner, that's fantastic. But if you're not, if you're a long-term tenant, maybe your landlord's going to allow you to um, short-term rent the property when you're out of town, et cetera. And, or maybe you want to be a co-host. Maybe you don't own property and you don't rent property, but you can be a co-host. And that's also a path to building wealth. And so we partner with these local organizations and we deliver this curriculum, this content, and we provide that support of like, maybe you just need that extra push. Maybe you just need that extra level of um, just somebody explaining what Airbnb is and how you can benefit from it. And so that is one way in which we've been very intentional about expanding um, the diversity. And it's not just the Hispanic community. Like one of the first ones uh, we um, ran here in the U.S. was actually with um, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina. So we are trying to be intentional about being inclusive across the spectrum when we talk about diversity and not being just focused on any one um, minority group, but um, really looking for ways to, to move the needle forward in that front. And I'll chime. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I can chime in and just very quickly say I appreciate your question. 
Um, so what we offer are payment options and uh, what we also offer, even through Master Your Card, as I was sharing earlier, are ways to educate consumers and individuals um, about uh, how credit can help you, right, um, by um, on-time payments, et, et, et cetera. And so our Master Your Card curriculum um, is designed to ensure that individuals know, and it's all on the website, so please do go um, and um, see that at your convenience. Um, we want to ensure that our communities are educated about what uh, our products are, um, how, how to budget the benefit of paying your card down and off, showing those real on-time payments, um, how that boosts your credit score. Um, and so for us, it's about providing options and providing access to options um, so that individuals can help to really build their financial portfolio, but also to uh, in ensuring that we're bringing the unbanked in into the banking system, right, and into the, the digital um, economies. So for us, um, that's how we ensure that we are sharing information, key information and uh, in, um, education relative to our products. Cesar, thank you for your question. And, and just for, for context for the group, right, on the pandemic happening around the March timeframe, um, around that time, uh, if you think we're, we're not a bank, so we actually issue that to be able to extend the loans. And in the event of payments on those loans uh, being within certain levels, that also creates an actual um, issue for opportunity in that sense. Uh, at, during that period of the March, uh, April timeframe, we we're just assessing the overall impact to the portfolio. And by the way, by June, we effectively dropped all of those uh, effective legal collections aspects. And as far as I know, we're the only company that executed that. Additionally, we also capped all their rates, and we had that one-click uh, hardship deferral program for anybody who would just send us a text and wanted to defer because of, of that, and we extended substantial deferrals during that period. Um, it's something that we, took, we take very seriously, but again, I, I don't know of anybody else who's dropped that, um, that process altogether, and we have not that sense. I love, I love the... the the depth of that, because I think that's, that's the complexity of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you so much again, Cesar, for bringing that up, because I think those are important conversations to have to make sure that we're also conducting business in a way that is inclusive of our communities, that, are, that we're challenging the status quo, that we're looking for new policy decisions, new policymakers. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to remember who are we here in service of, right? And so making sure that our communities are also benefiting from the, the role that technology can play, but we also have seen the harms and some of the, the predatory um, way that some of the business models have worked. And as I said at the beginning, it's not business as usual anymore. And it's time for definitely taking those learnings and moving forward and really looking at also additional opportunities, innovation. So with that said, I already got my five minutes. So I think I am done, unless there's any other pending burning questions. Before I bring in the, the wonderful CEO, Marco Davis, before, no? No more questions? All right. Well, that's it. Let's give, please, the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now it's my pleasure to bring Marco Davis, who's going to close out the entire day for all of us. So let's give it up for Marco. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Thank you, our panelists, for this incredible conversation. Thank you for our questioners in the audience for raising the important questions and for having this really important topic. Um, and thank you all for joining us at today's Tech Summit. Uh, we really appreciate your participation, your engagement, and your support. Uh, I want to once again thank our sponsors and our corporate partners for their generous support and their commitment to CHCI today and throughout the year, especially our host sponsor, Amazon. Uh, I want to thank not just these panelists and moderators, but all of our panelists and speakers and moderators today uh, for their insightful and engaging conversations on these critical topics. And I want to thank you, each of you for being here, and specifically you here in the room for staying with us till the very end of the day, for sticking it out, uh, and most importantly for doing your part to further our mission of developing the next generation of Latino leaders, because just by being here, just by supporting the organization and the work that we do, and most importantly, by carrying forward the conversations we've had today, you're gonna to ensure that our next generation of leaders are well-informed, uh, are motivated, and are engaged and active. 
As I mentioned at the start of the day, uh, at this, uh, earlier this year, we hosted an Education and an Economic Empowerment Summit. We hosted a uh, health summit. We also hosted on our inaugural 5K run, and of course, our signature Hispanic Heritage Month events uh, just earlier this fall, our 2022 Leadership Conference and our 45th Annual Awards Gala. What was so special about all those events this year is that we were finally back in person, as we are today. And there's something different about the energy in the room when we have these conversations and we can look at each other face to face, we can make comments, we can catch each other on the way out of the room to continue these conversations and these insights uh, and to continue to have those discussions and to build relationships, not just with our speakers and panelists, but with each other. And so I hope you're gonna continue to do that. Hope you're gonna continue to gather with each other to share the knowledge you've learned here for the rest of the year. And of course, we hope you continue to join us in our events once we get started once again in 2023. Of course, in the meantime, you can stay in touch with us uh, on social media. We are at CHCI on all the major platforms, uh, with the exception of Instagram, where we are at CHCI DC. Uh, and thank you once again on behalf of all the work that you do for our community to help ensure that we are part of this inclusive tech economy that we're trying to build and so that we're able to take our rightful place as equal partners in American society. Have a good afternoon and thank you very much.